let's go ahead and uh, talk about how we're going to organize this course. So we saw last time bonding is going to be lecture 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. My poor friend Polymer is left out. 9. Sorry for the horrible handwriting. <laughs> and 10. Now, one of the kind of uh, really important things and really cool things about material science is we're going to start, um, basically in this class, we're going to build up uh, from the ground floor, from atomistic length scales to millimeter length scales. So you're going to hear a lot of terms in this course like um, so length scales, th, length scales, time scales, uh, hierarchical structures, uh, and order of magnitude changes. Order of magnitude. An order of magnitude change is something that's 10 times greater. So any property that changes by a factor of tenfold is equal to one order of magnitude change. Now, if you're a mechanical engineer or a bioengineer, you're probably used to like 10%, 20%, 30% changes being very, very significant, uh, civil engineering too as well. But in material science, we are going to look at properties that can vary uh, basically from 1 to 15 orders of magnitude. Tremendous changes. Uh, you know, un, you know, really, you know, tremendous changes in properties and thus performance. Um, so those are the changes that we're looking for when we're trying to uh, invent or create or process a material differently to see a different uh, kind of property emerge. So uh, length scales. We are going to uh, basically start at this class uh, at the angstrom length scale. So at the angstrom length scale, you have basically two, you know, uh, two materials. This could be a copper. copper that are bonding, or actually, let's, let's have this. Uh, we're gonna look at, uh, and an angstrom is 10 to the minus one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Uh, so if you remember back from hopefully chemistry, chem 24, I think it's 1.54 angstroms for a fully saturated carbon-carbon bond. So we're looking, we're gonna start uh, in lecture one uh, at the angstrom length scale. Then we're going to kind of build up in size to the nanometer length scale. So that's 10 to the minus 9 meters. So at the nanometer length scale, you're going to start to see structures. So this is going to be lecture 1. You're going to start to see structures like this. So simple cubic, BCC, FCC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So BCC, CC, HCP, simple cubic. Uh, lots of different kind of structures emerge that are on the nanometer length scale. So this will be lectures 2 and 3. Then we're going to build up to the micrometer length scale, so 10 to the minus 6 meters. And we're going to look at basically grain structures or grain sizes. So if you have a material like here, you might see some kind of grain growth and particles around here and edges locations and other kind of uh, things, grain size uh, effects. So we're going to look here at like probably lectures 3, 4, uh, even 5. And then we're going to build up into our, and probably a little bit of lecture 6 as well, but then we're going to build up into the millimeter to meter length scale. So 10 to the minus 3 to 1 meter length scale. And so those are going to be where we have our, our sample and we're pulling our, our you know, dog bone sample and it's going to fracture here. So this will be lecture 7 and then 8, 9, and 10, etc. So when you're dealing with meter uh, you know, materials. So we're building up from the ground floor. But one of the key things in this course and in material science in general is going to be the way the reason why we start from this atomistic length scale is because structure is going to dictate properties. Structure dictates properties. Now, every kind of uh, discipline has their own uh, kind of structure or their own kind of diagram that shows what that uh, discipline is all about. But I think material, I, mean, I could be biased since I'm in material science, but I think materials, uh, uh, material science has the best uh, diagram. So this is the materials tetrahedron. So hopefully you know that a tetrahedron angle uh, is 109.46. Oh, Professor Steinway, you memorized some of this. Uh, so uh, we are going to utilize the four corners of this materials tetrahedron. So structure, properties, processing, and performance. So we are going to change one of those four corners. And at the center is characterization, modeling, uh, and experiments. This is us, you and me, all, bur uh, all burgeoning material scientists. Um, so... This is us at the center of the structure. And we're going to use this kind of idea to show this fundamental concept um, that structures are, structure will dictate the properties and performance. So when I was, uh, before I came to Pacific, uh, I was, um, I worked at Pittsburgh uh, in Pennsylvania at a, uh, basically a metal manufacturing company. 
So what we would do, there'd be these huge rollers. We'd take a big chunk of titanium or you know various metals, and we'd kind of put them through rollers, and out would come this flat sheet. So when you do this processing, this is called cold rolling or cold working. What happens here is you have initially a material. So let's say I have a material like this. My pure material one right here. So my pure material one, there's still some defects. Materials are like people. Everyone has defects. No one's, there's no perfect material. Uh, but the density of these defects is around 10 to the you know, uh, 7 per inverse, I think, centimeter squared. Don't quote me on this. Uh, uh, millimeter squared? Let's, 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 let's see again. Uh, there's a few, there's lower amount of defects in the uncold rolled material. But once you cold roll, there's tons of defects. The defect density increases by seven order of magnitude, uh, seven orders of magnitude to 10 to the 14. So we've done a process, cold working or cold rolling, that now has affected the structure of our material. What has it done to the properties of our material? Well, when you cold work, work a material, your yield strength, don't worry about if you don't know these uh, values yet, you'll look back on this video and say, ah, I know now, you know, once this class is over, I know what Professor Simon was talking about. When you cold roll material, your yield strength increases. So the stress that you have to place on material in order to yield it increases quite a bit. But your ductility, your strain at failure, decreases. So the material is, will not kind of extend and deform as much before it fractures. So that's kind of your, uh, your trading off uh, kind of perspective there. So you've now, again, we've done a process that's changed the structure, that's affected the properties, and now that has also affected the performance of our material. We might not be able, we can use it now in applications where uh, we might be exerted to larger uh, stress values, but if we need to be very, very ductile, this material is not going to work. So uh, on your first problem set, you're going to kind of look up and study uh, and do this kind of same uh, procedure for, uh, you could do for lead titanate. This is PBTI3. Uh, this is a cool material that has, we're going to look at in the XRD lab. It has a negative alpha less than one, negative thermal expansion coefficient. So as temperature increases, our material shrinks. So really cool, you could kind of look that up. Um, I already kind of did this one. You could look at cross string rubber. So again, the uh, I told you last time in class about the the old, um, the legend of Goodyear that uh, when you have rubber, it's just kind of this polybutadiene, to be pure rubber. Polybutadiene is just kind of this amorphous material, but if you chemically cross-link with sulfur disulfide bonds, you can create a cross-link network that now is uh, more rigid uh, and actually more you know, stiff than uh, this. So this is kind of your rubber tires. So again, we're changing the structure. that We're, we're doing a process, cross-linking, that changes the structure, which also changes the properties and also affects the performance. So Kevlar is a polymeric material. Uh, the structure looks a little bit something like this. So you process this Kevlar, and actually you make Kevlar, so that you have these rigid backbone uh, kind of fennel groups uh, that are hard to rotate. You have these intermolecular bonds, or H bonds, as opposed to these intramolecular carbon-carbon bonds. We'll get to that in a second. But again, you stretch out and, you know, you basically stretch out these kind of polymer chains, uh, and you increase the number of these intramolecular bonds that are actually very, very weak, less than 1 kT. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you increase the number of those bonds, and then your material is able to kind of withstand the impact of a bullet, which is amazing. So there's lots of different types of materials, metals, polymers, ceramics, composites, active matter, that we're going to kind of talk about and touch upon in this class, and there are various properties as well. So we are going to, again, look at this fundamental idea that structure, this lecture, dictate properties. So to do that, we need to kind of go to our most atomistic, atomistic perspective and look at our electrons, protons, neutrons, bonding, and hopefully do a quick review of that. So I'll, we'll do that in the next video. Thanks.